Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to um, uh, get things kicked off here pretty soon. Lauren, do you think uh, we have enough folks uh, admitted to begin? Yeah, I think we're ready. Great. Okay. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining today. I'm Daniel Gumnett, CCRF's CEO, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Um, our conversation is inspired by the hope in childhood cancer research. And because of donors like you, we're able to support bright and bold ideas in childhood cancer research. Thanks for being part of our mission. And it is my honor to introduce our speakers today. Uh, joining us will be Laura Sobiak. Uh, her son, Zach, was diagnosed with osteosarcoma, which is bone cancer, when he was 14 years old. During the three and a half years of Zach's battle with cancer, Laura learned some profound lessons about resilience, hope, gratitude. Today, she spends much of her time raising awareness about childhood cancer and CCRF's Zach Sobiak Osteosarcoma Fund. Our other guest today is Dr. Logan Spector, a professor and division director of the Division of Pediatric Epidemiology and Clinical Research at the University of Minnesota Medical School. His research focuses on the causes of childhood cancer with an emphasis on childhood leukemia, bone sarcomas, and heptoblastoma. His work includes traditional and genetic epidemiologic approaches. As you watch uh, our webinar today, please submit any questions you might have in our Q&A chat below. And when we wrap up today's webinar, we're hoping to answer as many of those questions as we can. And with that, I'd like to transition to Laura Sobiak. Thank you, Daniel. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Um, as Daniel indicated, I will be sharing our fundraising story with you this afternoon. Um, so our, our sort of, I have my, my title as a bridge of hope, and that's really what I consider our fundraising journey as a bridge of hope. Um, so my intention today is just to really share our story, how we ended up in this fundraising arena. Um, and as my byline indicates and why I never wanted to do this. So I just kind of want to walk that journey with you, um, how we ended up here and why it's an important place to be. Um, because it really is a story of hope. And I am so grateful to be here. I've been that the fund, Zach's fund was set up uh, almost 10 years ago now. So I've been actively fundraising for CCRF for about that long. And so I'm just going to share that journey with you. Um, as I said, fundraising was just not something I was interested in doing. It's um, in, in any arena, like that was just not my jam and I didn't want to be part of it. But then in 2009, my son, Zach, who at the time was 14 years old, was diagnosed with osteosarcoma bone cancer. So the thread of that story that I'd like to share with you today, as I've indicated, is how we ended up in fundraising. So how that story began. So that story begins um, about three years after Zach was diagnosed. Uh, we had used every type of chemotherapy that was known to actually bat this disease down and to give Zach the best chance that he had. We, we burned through all of those. He, um, in the, I think it was June of 2012, so about three, three years in, 
we found out that the cancer had spread in his lungs and also in his bones. It had spread in his pelvis. And we'd run out of options. There was nothing, there were no big guns, so to speak, left to treat Zach's cancer. We'd burned through all of those options. And so in my mind, there was really nothing left. Like we'd run out of, research had stopped for us, so to speak. There was nothing else significant out there to throw at this disease. And so it was a really desperate time for us. It was a, a devastating time. We were, we were getting used to the idea of Zach dying. And it was around that time, around July of 2012, um, that our connection with CCRF began. So it was about a month after we found out that Zach was terminal. We, we knew he had months to a year to live. And Mindy from Community Outreach at CCRF reached out to us. She heard our story and asked if we would be interested in sharing our story for a fundraising event that um, CCRF was a beneficiary of called the KS95 for Kids Radiothon. So it's a radiothon that happens at a local radio station here in the Twin Cities. And that fundraising event happens in December, but they were looking for families to interview about their childhood cancer experience that would run in rotation throughout the day on the fundraising day in December. So she reached out, <clears throat> excuse me, to our family, to me, via email and just said, hey, we, we've heard a little bit about your story and we were wondering if you'd like to participate in this fundraising event through sharing your story um, with an interview at the radio station that would be recorded. Well, at this point, of course, we'd been in the cancer world for a while, for a few years, and I'd watched other families kind of go through this evolution of you know, fighting cancer and then flipping over to being fundraisers. And while I knew I wanted that I wanted to do something to help and really needed to do something to help, fundraising was not it, as I've indicated. I had no interest at all in putting effort into a fundraiser. For one thing, I just didn't have the energy. Um, and of course, I'd heard of the millions of dollars spent on getting new drugs out there for treatments. I knew of the millions and millions of dollars that are put into research to get you know, clinical trials started and um, that lead to new drugs and new treatments. And it just seemed like too much. I just couldn't see how any little bit of money that we could raise would help with that big amount. And to me, it almost felt like at this point in our journey where we'd sort of run into a wall where research had ended for us, it kind of felt like if we did fundraising, it would just be, you know, like putting effort into throwing money down a pit. Like, I just didn't see the point of it. But sharing our story seemed like a simple way to help. So I talked to Zach about it. Um, he was very interested in doing whatever he could. He'd spent, you know, years in and out of the hospital. He'd witnessed kids much younger than him battling cancer, and it broke his heart. And he wanted to do something to help. So he was on board on board with um, doing that interview and helping with the fundraiser. Well, KS95 and CCRF had heard that Zach played guitar. So they asked if he would bring his guitar into the radio station that July morning um, to play and sing a song. And he did, he brought his guitar in, he recorded Jason Mraz's I'm Yours, which was very popular at that time. Um, he did a great job with the song. But as you can imagine, so they mixed it with the interview. That was the intention to mix his singing with the interview. And if you're familiar with the song, it's a very upbeat, um, joyful song. And the content of the interview was, of course, it, it had a somber undertone. It just, it didn't match well with the song. We were talking about end of life. You know, Zach was talking about what it was like to be a dying teenager. And I was talking about what it was like to parent a dying teenager. So, so the radio station reached out and asked if there was a different song that Zach knew that he could come in and record that might be a better fit to mix with the, um, with the interview. And Zach said he would think on it and then, you know, got busy with friends and August came and went and then school started. Um, his senior year started that September. Um, and he got busy and just kind of put it on the back burner. 
Well, at the end of September, I was downstairs in our family room kind of cleaning up. That's where Zach and his friends would hang out. They would hang out there in the evenings and play music. And so he had a lot of papers like, I don't know, random homework papers and a lot of snack wrappers and that kind of stuff laying around. And as I was cleaning up, you see here on the left-hand side, I found this piece of notebook paper. And these are the lyrics to Zach's song, Clouds. I, as I read through this, you know, read, read this paper, I realized that this was, that it was a song and that this was how Zach was going to say goodbye to us. When he got home that day, that afternoon, I handed him the paper and I said, Zach, did you write this? And he said, yeah, I did. And I recorded it too. And he pulled out his phone and he, he played the song for me. That was the first time I'd heard Zach singing his song, Clouds. Well, I got to thinking that this might be the perfect song to mix with that interview. So I asked Zach if he, he was okay with me sending it to the radio station and he was. Well, within hours that song circulated throughout the radio station landed on the desk of Dan Seaman, the, the general manager of the station. And Dan called me and he said, you know, I've heard your son's song. It's a really good song. And of course that was a relief for me because I'm Zach's mom, so I'm pretty biased. And I thought it was a good song, but to hear the radio station manager affirm that, I was pleased. So he said, yes, we definitely want to use it for the Radiothon. Would Zach be interested in recording it in a professional studio with professional musicians? So I asked Zach, and of course he was elated. He was all in. Well, what Dan set up that day, just a couple days later, he set up a professional studio in Minneapolis. Uh, professional musicians who all took the day off work to be there for a kid they'd never met. And he also hired a videographer, Mike, to record the event. And at that time, this, this whole thing was really just intended for our family and, and our friends to enjoy. So we spent the day together. It was just one of those magical, beautiful days. And as Mike was putting the video together for us, he reached out to me and he asked if I would be, if I thought it would be a good idea to put some slides inserted into the video that sort of told Zach's story so that the content of the song made sense. And I said, yeah, that's a really good idea. And while you're at it, could we put a link to CCRF at the end? So if people are moved by Zach's story, they, they can do something about it. They can give to CCRF. Well, that idea was shared with CCRF and that's really how Zach's fund was born, the Zach Sobiak Osteosarcoma Fund. CCRF went ahead and they set up a fund under the umbrella of CCRF um, with the intention of all the money raised going directly to osteosarcoma research, which I could not have asked for um, for an easier way to do fundraising. So they set that up for us. Um, we ended up putting that link at the end of the video. And again, just a super easy way to become part of this fundraising journey for us. Well, that December, um, the video, the finished video with the link was uploaded onto YouTube and the Radiothon interview was played in rotation on KS95. It was December 6th. Um, so the Radiothon was happening and I think actually at that time it was a two-day event. And so his song and his interview was playing in rotation locally. And the video started to blow up nationally and internationally. So the song, the, the video went up December 6th. By December 31st, it had reached um, over 2 million people. And donations began to come in. It was a, a really exciting time. And, and Zach got to witness that too, which was really cool. As news of Zach's story spread, um, and, it, and it went fast and wild, it was international, it was in newspapers, it was on the news, national news outlets were sharing it. We had a crew from um, LA come and do a documentary. They spent five days with us in February of 2013, recording interviews with Zach and they put together a documentary. Um, and that documentary was uploaded onto YouTube on May 3rd, Zach's 18th birthday. And all of this attention was just really generating a lot of interest in Zach's story and his music. 
Zach passed away on May 20th of 2013. And his song Clouds began to climb the charts. Um, we watched it climb throughout the whole day of his visitation. And by the end of the day, it ended up at number one. It was, it just um, kept going and it stayed there at number one for four days, which makes it the first song in music history to reach that level of success without national radio play or the help of a record label. So the donations began to really pour in at this point. Um, by fall of 2013, we had $568,000 to give um, for research. Nearly 50%, so 48% of those donations came in at $100 or less, and they were nationwide, or nationwide and internationally. It was, it was quite amazing. I was completely blown away by the response to Zach's story and to his music. It was just a really, um, a really beautiful time for our family. Heart wrenching, gut wrenching, but also beautiful because so many people were showing they cared by joining us in this fundraising effort. But to be honest, even with this big chunk of money, and this to me is a big chunk of money. I really wondered if it would have an effect in the osteosarcoma research world. Because again, you know, this understanding that it takes millions of dollars to get a drug on the market that's gonna help these kids. And so I just really wondered, you know, like, does this mean anything? <laughs> Rob and I, my husband Rob and I had the opportunity with this amount of money to sit down with a group of researchers at the University of Minnesota. And one of those researchers is Dr. Logan Spector, who will be presenting in just a little bit. And the other one, another one is Dr. Brenda Weigel, who is pictured here on the right um, in the black jacket. That's Zach's oncologist. Um, but there were, I think, six more researchers at that table. And they were there because they all had a common interest in studying osteosarcoma, which is a very rare disease in the scope of diseases. And so it was, kind of, it was a unique experience for, for us. Um, but when I sat down at that table, still, even though we had this tremendous outpouring of giving from people all over the world and the potential to raise a lot more because all of the money that is raised with, by Zach's music, every dime of Zach's music money goes to his fund. I still was just kind of pessimistic about this. And so as we were sitting down at the table with this group of people, I, can't, I remember starting with just asking them openly, like, okay, to me, this is a lot of money, but is it to you? Does this money matter at all in the scope of research? Can we do anything meaningful with this money? And it was really their response to that question. I remember um, one of the researchers in particular, the look on his face, I think if he could have crawled across that table and just grabbed me and said, yes, it matters, um, he would have. But it was really their response that day that sort of flipped my view of things and gave me hope. What I learned that day was the importance of those preclinical studies and that seed grant money that feeds those, those concepts. So these preclinical studies are so important. They're that bridge of hope that my talk is titled after. This is the bridge and it's not a big bridge. It's not a huge bridge, but it does take funding. And so what I realized that day was, yeah, there are ideas out there. My idea that research had just run out, that there were no more good ideas out there to, to treat osteosarcoma, um, that wasn't true. There are ideas out there. What, they, what we need is money to fund them, to get those preclinical studies done to prove that we have a good idea that we can build on and get those millions of dollars. I didn't understand that pathway. So what I learned that day was the huge importance of that bridge between a concept and phase trials. And what I also learned that day was that chunk of money was hugely important to build that bridge. And that brings me huge hope, enormous hope, because that means 
that even the small donations, even the smallest of donations helps us build that bridge. And I really, as the years have gone on, have become passionate about that bridge, those preclinical studies, that seed grant funding, because, because you can make a huge impact with a little bit of money. You can build that bridge to the bigger studies. Um, so it's really actually kind of a fun place to be for me because it's almost like a, a treasure hunt, you know, like things pop up and this is probably a mixing metaphors here, but things pop up and we can say, yeah, we can fund that. And that's an empowering place to be. So some of the things that we've been able to, some of the projects we've been able to help fund that really bring me hope. Um, we have been able to invest in a, a study of a biomarker blood diagnostic test. And this comes from the, the uh, School of Veterinary Science with Dr. Jaime Modiano. He's, he works with dogs who also get osteosarcoma. And it's looking like we'll be able to someday soon have a blood test that will be able to tell at the time of diagnosis what strain of osteosarcoma. So there's, there's one that's very deadly, which is what Zach had, and there's one that responds to the chemotherapy. And this blood marker, um, biomarker blood diagnostic test will help us help indicate that. We've been able to invest in preclinical data procurement that will lead to a clinical trial of a drug that inhibits a molecule in a tumor microenvironment that essentially turns the tumor on so the immune system can recognize it. So turning a cold tumor into a hot tumor. Um, that's another exciting project that, that I um, am looking forward to where that goes. We've been able to invest in a new model system that leads to a better understanding of how osteosarcoma works, how it forms. And that too, the, those learnings will lead to new therapeutic interventions. And we've also been able to um, invest in building new data sets that will lead to better understanding of the disease. And I'm, I'm guessing Logan will talk a bit more about that. Um, but this is important. And I've, I've learned this along the way that not only do these small diseases need funding because they don't get a lot of attention, but we also need data. Um, there are around, I think it's a 450 people in the United States diagnosed a year with osteosarcoma. And while that sounds like a lot, and it is a lot, the data is really important to gather together. And so that's a big piece of the puzzle and we've been able to invest in that. So what brings me the most hope? Well, to be honest, it's donors like you. Part of the reason I was so resistant to the idea of fundraising is because it's exhausting. And what ends up happening quite often, especially in the pediatric cancer world, is that it's the parents who sort of bang the pots and pans together to get attention. And it's, a, it's an exhausting thing. So it's really donors like you who walk alongside us and help us in this journey. We can't do it without people who help us along the way. So it's really donors like you. And I'd like to take just a moment to thank you for joining us not only today but in this mission that we all care passionately about so thank you i think we're going to go ahead and introduce dr logan specter now daniel do you have some words to say there I guess not. Logan, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to you. Oh, I'm sorry. I, my, for some reason, my screen froze and I wasn't <laughs> able to unmute. Finally, I had to, so my apologies. Now, now I've had the Zoom mishap, so Logan will be uh, clear and free. There won't be any, any issues. So thank you, Laura. That was, um, I really appreciate you sharing your story. That was really moving and shows the power of community and hope. And when so many people join in our mission in whatever way that they can, if it's really, I appreciate your story. And with that, I'm going to uh, uh, pass it off to um, Logan. Thank you. Thanks. And um, I, I I don't have nearly as, 
as um, dramatic a, a story arc as, as Laura, but uh, I uh, simply want to say what a, an honor it's been to know her family and uh, be even a small part of, um, you know, Zach's life and legacy. Uh, I, I did attend his concert at uh, the varsity, um, although uh, we never met, but uh, it, it still remains, you know, one of the most significant events of my life to have uh, to have attended. Um, and, uh, you know, I was asked to speak about uh, hope uh, and childhood cancer and um, from the scientist perspective. So uh, I'm really happy to be here and um, tell you what, what gives me hope um, and uh, also how CCRF fits into the picture. So um, I just wanna take you back to the 1960s. Uh, I don't personally remember them because uh, I was born in 1973, but I will highly recommend that you read the book, uh, The Emperor of All Maladies. Um, it's by, uh, last name is Mukherjee. Um, in any case, that is a, a history of cancer and cancer treatment. And a um, large portion of the book is uh, talking about uh, an oncologist who was in Boston uh, named Sidney Farber, uh, the, the Harvard Cancer Center. Dana Farber is now uh, named uh, after him or part of it is named after him. Um, and, you know, he was the discoverer of uh, early chemotherapy, uh, antifolate chemotherapy for um, childhood leukemia. The fact is, in the, uh, up until the mid-60s, cancer in children was almost universally uh, fatal. And um, in the 60s, they started having success with chemotherapy, uh, unfortunately, using monotherapy, meaning one agent. Um, would knock back the cancer, uh, but then it would come roaring back. So the, the early successes were, were temporary. I think quickly oncologists figured out that um, because cancers have acquired the ability to, to survive, um, to survive uh, against the interests of the, the child, um, they needed to use more than one chemotherapy in combination. And so um, that proved uh, successful for many, many childhood cancers. So uh, you may have heard, and this actually did take place when, when I was born, uh, President Nixon declared a war on cancer. Um, and uh, that's when the National Cancer Institute was founded um, and a lot of the National Cooperative Clinical Trials groups were founded. Childhood cancer was a, an early and sustained success of the war on cancer, meaning that a, a lot of cancers that were previously universally fatal were um, uh, became uh, less so. Um, although the um, success was not evenly spread. Leukemias, it turned out, most forms were um, easier to knock back, to put into remission. Uh, but some tumors, including osteosarcoma, which you heard about earlier, have proven uh, resistant. The, the um, survival improved, but then has plateaued for the last um, 30 or 40 years. And um, I think the, the reason is this. Some cancers were just inherently uh, easier to treat, and others have uh, resistant biology that needs to be the, the subject of further focus. But the first thing that gives me hope is, um, you know, the last 40 years of pediatric oncology have been successful in um, extending the, the life of children who are diagnosed with cancer. That said, um, the therapies that are used to treat um, childhood cancer have largely uh, not changed over the last, uh, uh, over this period. And clearly they need to for two reasons. The one, um, the, the, you know, messing around with the same chemotherapy, giving it in different doses and different regimens and different timing 
only gets us so far and has not really improved um, outcomes. Uh, and so there is a desperate need for new ways to attack these cancers, not just using the same um, uh, old chemo that's been used for many years. Secondly, chemotherapy as we currently know it is um, very toxic to the child. And um, while though there are, is improvement in survival, survival comes at a cost uh, to the child in terms of um, uh, learning deficits, um, in terms of uh, changing their metabolism, uh, so that they, they uh, a larger share gets what's called metabolic syndrome, which is a constellation of symptoms that um, lead to cardiovascular disease. Um, survivors have risk of second cancer, both from therapy, but also from uh, underlying a predisposition. And, um, you know, they, they generally do not live as long as they otherwise would have if they had not gotten cancer. So one reason to, to find alternatives to chemotherapy is uh, that it, it, it the late effect. Um, I liken it to uh, washing your car with a fire hose. You will get the, the car clean, but, but you may also peel off some paint. And um, chemotherapy is a, a blunt instrument. So the thing that gives me hope is the um, field is working very hard to find um, uh, targeted therapies and uh, also relatedly immunotherapies. And I'm just going to describe those very briefly. Um, a targeted therapy means that rather than just trying to kill the um, uh, growing cells, so chemotherapy uh, interferes with the growth of cells. Of course, cancers grow faster than uh, normal cells. Um, and so the hope is when you give chemo, you're going to kill all the cells that are dividing and most of those will be cancer. But there of course are other cells that are dividing in the body. For instance, hair follicles are, are often dividing and that's why chemotherapy can uh, cause hair loss because uh, the follicles have been killed along with the cancer cells. Um, a targeted therapy is only going to affect the cancer cell because it targets a mutation that's only present in the cancer cell. And um, this is somewhat of a, a holy grail in oncology to target only the cancer cell and not the healthy cells that you, you wish to keep going. Um, we have some successes in um, uh, targeted therapy. Uh, just to name one, there's a drug called larotrectinib, which um, is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor it inhibits a, a mutated form of this, um, of this gene. Now, this targeted therapy was developed for lung cancer, which is uh, obviously magnitudes of order uh, more common um, in adults uh, and doesn't appear at all in kids. But by coincidence, um, the, this uh, mutation that the drug targeted also was present in a very rare uh, pediatric cancer, so rare that uh, even those who um, are, are longtime CCRF supporters may not have heard of it. It's called infantile fibrosarcoma. Um, and once larotrectinib was developed for lung cancer in adults, the pediatric oncologist said, well, we really have to try it in, in this form of cancer. And it took it from um, a uh, uh, very difficult diagnosis to one that is treated um, quite easily with um, pretty minimal side effects. Um, and so uh, that was what I would call a happy accident when you can repurpose a drug that is developed in adults for children. Um, but uh, there are a lot of mutations in uh, childhood cancers that aren't, um, don't appear in adults. And we absolutely need to develop uh, targeted therapies specifically for them. You know, because of the way that the pharmaceutical market works, um, very common diseases get uh, the attention because that's where the market is. And um, I don't know if you call it a market failure or what, but uh, obviously companies that are out to make money uh, aren't necessarily going to invest the R&D 
in mutations that affect small number of kids. So this is one reason that um, CCRF and uh, other foundations and NIH are very, very necessary to create the funding ecosystem uh, that will support um, uh, pharmaceutical development for uh, uh, very rare mutations and rare cancers, uh, because I simply don't think that industry is is going to um, have the incentive to pay uh, attention. The other area of therapy that gives me hope is immunotherapy. And um, you may well have heard something about that uh, in, in general, but the idea is this. Um, a cancer has uh, acquired the ability to survive against the, the interests of the, the child. And in doing so, the tumor mutates. And when it does that, it creates mutant proteins on the surface of the cells that aren't normally there. And uh, as you probably know, the immune system um, has a, a, the ability to recognize what we call foreign proteins um, and then you know, destroy those. Uh, any cells that they're attached to. And um, of course, when a bacteria comes along, uh, those proteins will be immediately recognized as uh, not part of um, the person. Uh, but cancer proteins are, um, uh, you know, mutant forms of human proteins, and so may or may not uh, elicit a, a strong immune response. A lot of immune therapy is meant to enhance that immune response um, uh, from the host. So uh, creating uh, T cells, which are the ones that train uh, white cells and other um, types of cells to uh, attack uh, the, the foreign cells. So in other words, we're sort of artificially training the immune cells to target the tumor. This has had great success in some classes of tumors, uh, particularly hematopoietic cancers. It has proven a little bit harder yet to target solid tumors. Uh, that's partly because you know, the solid tumor forms a mass and you also have to uh, find a way for the tumor cells to infiltrate um, into that mass. But uh, it is a, an enormous field, almost becoming its own subspecialty, for instance, uh, a lot of um, departments or, or divisions of uh, blood and marrow transplant now also say cellular therapy and recognition of um, uh, of the immunotherapy component. So um, lastly, uh, I'll just say that um, childhood cancer oncology has uh, had great success in um, saving a lot of the kids. Uh, in, starting in the 60s to the 70s, and then in the 80s, realizing that uh, survival came at a cost. So there's also a, a huge um, program of research trying to understand childhood cancer survivors' uh, unique health needs and to improve their quality and length of life as well. And I'll just uh, add, you know, uh, end with one uh, more uh, piece of hope, which is that uh, over the years, as chemotherapy has been dialed back or the treatment regimens have been tailored, as immunotherapy and targeted therapies come online, as the radiation has been dialed down, it has been documented that while they still have, uh, survivors still have an elevated uh, risk of mortality throughout life, that risk has been lowering. So, um, you know, the, the trends are all in the right direction. And, um, you know, we need the support of people like you to keep the momentum going. So uh, that's all I have for my off the cuff remarks, but I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you, uh, Logan, really appreciate it. And we do have some questions and if people have additional questions, please feel free to continue to put them into the, um, the questions chat at the bottom of your screen or in the chat and we'll, we'll try to address them if we can. Um, and uh, Logan, as well, long as I have you on the screen, uh, one of the questions that's come through um, relates to RNA and it's, are there any new ideas coming from the RNA advances that happened during COVID? 
Yeah. So, um, of course, we've known about RNA for a very long time. Um, I think that the question might be, can we use uh, an RNA vaccine, which is what um, Pfizer and Moderna and, and maybe some of the other versions of um, vaccines, uh, could, could those be used in, in cancer? And the short answer is people are exploring RNA vaccines for um, many uh, uh, applications. Um, including as a, an anti-cancer agent. But uh, to my knowledge, that hasn't made it to human trials yet. So uh, it's still in development. Um, but certainly the, the success and rapid rollout of RNA vaccines for COVID-19 is uh, um, being studied to, to understand what side effects are and um, of this general class of medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and I expect we'll see some of those roll out for cancer in the near future. Great. So I have well, another another quick question for you, Logan, and then I'll go to go to some questions for for Laura. Um, Dr. Logan, what has been the most exciting or rewarding advancement in research or treatment that you have personally been part of? Um, and what is an example from your research of one area that um, we are on the verge of taking a huge step forward in pediatric cancer diagnosis and treatment? That's a big, big question. It is very big, um, but I, I was asked specifically about my research. Um, so, you know, I talked quite a bit about the, the oncologists who are, have the hands-on um, uh, uh, patients who are running trials. Uh, I don't so much do drug discovery or clinical trials myself. Um, I, I am concerned with understanding why kids get cancer and hoping to prevent it entirely. Um, without a doubt, for my personal research, uh, the thing that has, um, you know, taken over in the last 10 years is simply the ability to read a genome uh, in for uh, a couple thousand dollars that was not there um, 10 years ago. So there's an absolute uh, flood of information about the genome. And when we talk about cancer, there's two genomes. There's the normal genome that the child was you know, born with. And then there's uh, the, the somatic genome, the mutated genome of the cancer. Our ability to read those is um, opening the, the book of life to us, which uh, we're learning rapidly how to read. And um, it is giving us new insight into the causes of these cancers. For my part, uh, I hope that we can take that information, identify which kids are at highest risk, and come up with a strategy for either detecting it early to improve outcomes or prevent it entirely. Well, thank you, Logan. Um, I'm going to say that you are actually doing research that is helping and is on the verge of taking a big step forward. The work you're doing in the data commons area harmonization of data, you know, you are an international leader in that area. And while it may not be developing a specific new treatment, your work is definitely playing in a really important um, role in the entire field of developing new treatments from the, from the data work you're doing. So thank um, you. You're welcome. So, so Laura, I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, one is, again, is related to research what has been the most inspiring or exciting advancement in research? And you may have talked about this in your presentation. Um, most exciting advancement in research or treatment that you have seen as a result of the Zach Sobiak Fund? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, I think the biomarker that can be tested, um, the mm -hmm. blood test is exciting. Like that didn't exist five years ago or 10 years ago when Zach was still alive. Um, I will answer more generally because we have a lot of irons in the fire. So it's, it's hard to narrow it down, but I'm very excited. So when Rob and I were at that table, that first meeting we had, we came at it from very different approaches. I really wanted to understand the genetics of osteosarcoma and how I just felt like if we understand what went wrong with the genetics, then we can figure out how to treat it. And Rob really wanted to get a new drug out there that could help kids right away. And we've actually, because we've raised over $3 million now, we've been able to do that. We've been able to invest in research that's attacking 
or you know gearing up for battle on both fields so in a generalized way of answering this question i'm excited about all of it because i know and this also brings me help i know that none of it's wasted like just because you get let's say for example we did a clinical trial semaphore d we were able to invest in that a new drug that we thought might help an existing drug it went to a clinical trial and like it's not a cure-all it didn't give what we would consider to be um like it wasn't successful so to speak but now we know something that we didn't before so none of this is wasted which i i also love that about research it's like okay we we learn some things we move on so in a general way of answering that question i'm excited about all of it thank you laura that's a that's a a, a great answer and while we're we're talking about hope um there's a question that's more personal about, was it difficult to feel hope while Zach was in active treatment? And um, what are the things that gave you hope during that time? Um, yeah, that's a big question. Yeah. It depends on what point in treatment, you know, we really did, at the beginning, there are things that can be used. So, you know, there's, okay, if this doesn't work, then we can move to this. Um, so that brings you hope and you really do focus on like, okay, now the next thing is, is this next chemotherapy, we're going to give that a try. And as those go away, and I talked about this a little bit was, you kind of do lose hope in the medical, you know, side of things. Um, so yeah, I would say you do lose hope in that once you run run out of options. There's just no other way to put it. What kept us going was Zach. You know, we he put himself out there. He gave of time, the little time that he had to invest in people and an idea. Um, and I, I just... I'm so grateful that he got to see the beginning of the fruits of that labor because it was important to him. So now that he's gone and his legacy is left behind, it's his legacy that brings me hope. Thank you, Laura. Um, Logan, there's a, a, a question um, from uh, Greg uh, Kayser. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, my daughter was successfully treated in 2004, 2005 for osteo. I think I'm hearing that the same chemos are being used today. Is that? Yeah, um, the, the fact is, um, as I alluded to in my remarks, uh, using a lot of the same chemos and, and maybe mixing and matching the order or the intensity um, or how much you give before you try surgery, but um, you know none of that seems to have uh, changed much. Um, the fact is to bring a new therapy to um, practice is a, a very long and involved process. You know, starting with in vitro studies, uh, animal studies, and then um, finally phase one studies, uh, which are small. Um, clinical trials, which are, are meant to determine safety and dosing rather than anything else. So we do have agents that are under small, you know, phase one um, studies, but it's going to be a while before they get to uh, go um, to the larger um, number of kids. The other thing you have to realize, especially for osteosarcoma, there's about 400, 450 kids a year diagnosed in the U.S., um, you really have to, uh, can only do one trial at a time. Um, and so, you know, you have to be very sure that you have uh, an agent worth testing or you, or you can lose years. Thank you, Dr. Spector. And um, Greg says, um, all the more reason to fundraise for the work right now um, to make it even a little grimmer in terms of how long we've been using these chemotherapies. Um, my mother died of bone cancer in 1985, and the treatments that she was receiving then are 
many of them are still being used today. And um, it's um, we would we would hope to to have seen um, more advancements, but it's a very very intractable disease. But we are making progress. Um, there is another question that's come in, and it it's um, Daniel. Would you where do you see CCRF headed in the next few years? Any growing areas uh, of the organization? That's a really um, great question, and a lot of it's been, I think, also teed up by by what Laura and um, Logan have talked about. Um, we are working very hard to determine where we can make the greatest impact, and we're spending a lot of time and effort right now um, researching the childhood cancer ecosystem to, to determine where we can create a leverage point that can make that big jump that we're that we're all looking for. Um, some of the areas that we are uh, making investments and increasing investments are um, in survivorship that Dr. Um, Spector talked about. You know, we have had greater success in treating cancer for children, which means that we have many more cancer survivors that, um, and we're working really hard on um, finding ways of staying engaged with cancer survivors and um, helping them preempt the kinds of challenges that they might face later in life. Uh, the other thing that we're looking at um, very closely is less toxic, um, the, the targeted treatments that, that Dr. Spector was talking about, um, you know, particularly gene cell immunotherapy. The other area where we're making increasingly large investments is in um, data. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, Spector mentioned um, how rare the disease is and how important it is to pool the data and biobanks and the like. Um, an area that we've been investing recently is providing um, funding for more, um, for the human capital side, for more folks uh, to actually analyze the data. So we've been paying for um, computational biologists uh, to work with these data sets. And another area that we're focusing increasingly on um, is disparities in cancer outcomes. There is a huge difference in outcomes for children with cancer, depending on what part of the country they live in or what kind of insurance they have or their race or their economic status. We don't need more research to show that there are these disparities in outcomes based on geography and the like. Um, we are trying to figure out um, where we can fund interventions that will actually make a difference and 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 have a more um, have less kids have poor outcomes because of where they live or um, the circumstances that they live in. So, um, unless there are any additional questions, which I'm not seeing any more on my screen here. Um, uh, Laura, if you'd like to come back, um, I'd like to 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 thank um, Dr. Uh, Specter and Laura for your participation today. Your stories were really inspiring and and hopeful. And um, you know, it's it's a real privilege and honor for all of us at CCRF to have an opportunity to work with with both of you. And um, I think what you're talking about is the power of hope and the power um, of, of, of how many of us all working together in whatever way that we can is gonna help us move our mission forward. Um, I'd like to also thank um, Lauren Brink for helping organize this entire event. So thank you, Laura. Lauren, you did a great job and thank everybody for attending. I'd um, like to remind you um, that there is going to be a recording of this sent out next week. Um, so if you have any lingering questions, feel free to email. And Lauren, if you'd like to put your contact information up, share that, that would be really helpful. And with that, I want to thank, uh, thank everybody again for attending. And um, there's Lauren's contact information. And have a great rest of the day. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Logan. Thank you.